another Haymarket Books author, friend of the family, and all around Chicago, Badass E.L. <laughs> all right, so I'm just going to go ahead and start with the bios on the top for those who are uninitiated. And at this point, I don't know how you could be, but. <laughs> All right, starting first, Rachel Rach Jackson is a writer, educator, and performer. Her poems have gained over 2 million views on the YouTube. Wow. 2 million, 2 million people clicking on my poems. I love it here. She is the 2017 New Pick Champion and a 2017 Pink Door Fellow. Jackson recently voiced DJ Rach in the Jackbox game, Mad Bar City. She voices Tiffany in Batu. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Wonderful. An upcoming animation recently picked up by Cartoon Network. Her latest play, Emotions in Box, premiered at the Words Festival in Lucerne, Switzerland. Honey, she's international now. Her latest her latest um, debut collection of poems called Even the Saints Audition. Even the Saints Audition was picked for Chicago readers, one of the best books of Chicago. Round of applause. <laughs> all right, next up on deck. I mean, Jimmy the Woods. What all can we say about Jimmy? <laughs> hey, Chicago Red singer, songwriter, and award winning poet whose inspirations include the illustrious Gwendolyn Brooks, respect, and Toni Morrison, also respect. Following the 2016 release of her debut album, Heaven, Woods received critical acclaim for her singular sound that is both rooted in soul and holy mind. Her 2019 sophomore release, Legacy, Legacy, I have to say it, <laughs> featured 12 tracks named after writers, thinkers, and visual artists who have influenced her life and work. She is a Pushcart Prize winning poet and co-editor of Breaking Poets, Black Girl Magic, released in 2018. E.L. Ewing, among being a superhero and writing about the superheroes. <laughs> The sociologist of education and writer from Chicago. She is the award-winning author of four books, The Poetry Collections, Electric Arches in 1919. Oh, I'm sorry, where were those books published? <laughs> <Hey, Martha. laughs> the nonfiction work goes in the schoolyard racism and school closings on Chicago's South Side, an integral and vital piece of work. And most recently, a novel for young readers, Maya and the Robot. She is the co-author with Nate Marshall of the play No Blue Memories, The Life of Women. Last but certainly not least, and Ooh. I know Eve and all of the loves are going to shine so many flowers on their dear beloved, but Diamond Sharp is a poet and essay is from Chicago. Super Sad Black Girl is her debut collection of poems. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eve is already a phenomenal poet and a wonderful community member, both between here and in Brooklyn. She has been lighting up the media scene, and making sure all of the cultural things that need to be talked about be talked about. This is where the work happens as well. So I'm super excited about this event. Thank you so much, and please enjoy. Yay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, so in the theme of Super Sad Black Girl, um, I'm going to read some poems uh, that are either super sad or maybe in a black girl. You remember me? <laughs> Um, uh, so uh, the first one is, um, I wrote this, uh, Iman Loren had a workshop about vices, and they're bald now, but I believe in long nails, and they, 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 they have my heart and soul, all right? I, I, I just think that if I could just, that's my jam, you know? <laughs> but, uh, it, oh, well, you know, they are difficult. Um, I saw some nods, everybody felt, well, my people who wear the long nails, you understand the difficulty. Um, so this is a poem about that, and it's called, Even My Nails Hurt Me. My nails fall in love with everything but my hands. They commit to slam doors and cracks in the couch, quietly rip themselves from my fingers while my blood makes the sound. I try to keep my nails on my fingers with super glue and enlist keys to pry open pop cans change the shape my nails naturally grow into. I am their sun, shave the sides of their heads. I am their shadow. Still, they want out. Even when I tend to their needs before mine, I dress my nails in glitter without asking 
and paint them the color I deserve to feel. No costume can make them belong to me. I hope they miss me. Instead, they giggle under dust piles with my skin attached to their backs. Mall plastic chunks hiding in the corners of my apartment, thrilled to be free. Yeah. And then I um, am very big on persona poems. Like, that's my, like, um, <clears throat> shiznit. Because, <laughs> you know, we keep it, keep it G-rated. Um, so I wrote, <laughs> I wrote a poem um, as a broken fingernail. It's a Sistina. So it's a little longer. Uh, Sistina from the Broken Fingernail. And it must be nice to always be part of the family, to never question if your presence is welcome. I am a rotating disappointment, a peaceful tune until the record scrape, desperately trying to make you see the beauty in the jacket, the rich dirt as gold. How dare I compare myself to gold? I don't even have anyone who claims me as family. No one is ever praised for being jagged. Even a sword is smooth on its sides and still welcome, despite the cut, despite the scrape. Why would I ever get used to being a disappointment? How does one grow out of being a disappointment? Learn to reroute their roots and sprout their own gold. Snatch a layer of gel over myself to hide the scrape. When I'm perfect again, I will be accepted by my family. Only beings that look the same on those hands can be welcomed. There will never be union in the jagged. Pain is an obvious part of going from smooth to jagged, yanking my invitation card from the disappointment, reforming this ash to, into a sturdy welcome, roughly shining my body until I am sparkling gold, remolding my parts together and creating a family. Finally, I can have results from the scrape. And to think, I used to dread the scrape, rub myself against her hand so she too can feel the jacket. Wonder if the pain is always worth the family. What happens if you can't reshape disappointment? Throw acetone on what pretends to be gold and watch the beauty burn away with the welcome. It's exhausting, the constant recycling of welcomes, the rotation of the machine ready for the scrape. It's what has to be done, to be worthy, to be gold. After the appointment, she always shows off what's no longer jagged. Effortless hand motions cutting through the disappointment. If her hand waves fast enough in the blur, we all might look like family. <laughs> Before I read my last one, I just want to congratulate Diamond and Candace. This is super exciting. And so um, I feel like the majority of us on the stage might identify with being. Um, Black girls that can struggle braiding hair, you know. I'm bald headed. I'm bald headed. Now. <laughs> I, I, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm, back in the day, I wasn't like this, you know. Um, and it was it was hard. I didn't really. Yeah, I was always the uh, what you, uh, the hair model. Um, everyone always wanted to braid my hair, and I didn't really learn. And then I learned, and then I shaved it all off. So yeah. Um, so this is a Sistina for the black girl who does not know how to braid hair. <laughs> From the voice of my auntie. Okay. <laughs> it's a track, honestly. <laughs> okay, here we go. Your hands have no more worth than tree stumps at harvest. See if you have boom, right? Like, <laughs> right. right? Your hands have no more worth than tree stumps at harvest. Don't sit on my porch while I make myself useful. Break secrets and scalps on summer days for my sisters. Secure every strand of gossip with tight rubber bands of value. What possessed you to ever grow your nails so long? How can you have history without braids? A black girl is She dances with them, whipping down her back like corn in winds of harvest. Braiding forces our reunions to be like the shifts your mother's work, long. I find being surrounded by your own is useful, gives our blood more value, solidifies your place with your race, with your sisters. Your block is a layer cake of your sisters. Force your lips quiet and sweet, and they'll speak when they need to practice braids. Your hair length is the only part of you that holds value. The tallest crop is worshiped at harvest. So many little hands in your head. You are finally useful. Your hair is yours. Your hair is theirs. Your hair is, for a black girl, long. Tender-headed ass won't last around here long. Cut your nails and use your fists to protect yourself against your sisters. 
Somehow mold those hands useful. Your hair won't get pulled in fights if they're in braids. Beat out the weak parts of crop during harvest. When they are limp and without soul, they have value. If you won't break or defend yourself, what is your value? Sitting on the porch until dark sweeps in, needing to be invited. You'll be needing long. When the crop is already used, what is its worth after harvest? You'll learn that you can't trust those quick to call themselves your sisters. They yearn for the gold that is in braids. You hold on your shoulders a coveted item that is useful. Your presence will someday become useful. There will be one day the rest of your body will stagger under the weight of its value. Until then, sit in silence in the front with your scalp on fire from the braids. I promise you won't be needing long. One day, you will love yourself on your own without validation of sisters, no longer a stump, wailing for affection at harvest. That's so beautiful. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to read just a few poems. Um, this first one is after a quote by Amanda Williams. It's, you're hard-headed and tender-headed at the same time, Black. <laughs> You're hard-headed and tender-headed at the same time, Black. I washed my hair in hard water and became hard-headed. I'm stubborn about my softness. I comb my hair from the bottom up, detangle whole fields with my bare hands. No caterpillars were harmed in the growing of these inches. I sleep good, head wrapped in imitation silk. I squeeze warm oils in the valleys between my lazy twists, lay in bed for hours after waking, massage my scalp with the fattest edge of my fingers. Years ago, in the chair, when they asked, I'd answer no, proud of what I could take without a whimper. Now I impress myself with the time I spend carefully unraveling each knot. Is it really the worst thing to be delicate and hell-bent on feeling good? Um, Diamond, I love your book so much. It's so beautiful, and as I was reading it, I was just wishing I had it as a teenager to know that I wasn't the first and only one to feel that way as a black girl. And I also loved how Chicago it was. Um, so these next couple poems are invoking Chicago people. May Jemison at the beauty shop. As far as I'm concerned, the hair lab on 95th Street is the moon. I fit my head inside the plastic bubble, set the timer, and watch in the mirror the anti-liftoff. I am proof nowhere in the universe can a black girl feel her own hair, heavy, except the shop or shower. I travel for miles to suit up in my backwards plastic cape. The beautician's foot pumps the chair pedal, rocket launch into the simulator. Invisible hands unravel each helix. The dryer calls them back. Curls become smaller and smaller, shrinking like the city. The first time I watched it disappear from the sky. radio stations, Ode to Herb Kent. Yes. Your voice crawls across the dashboard of Grandma's Dodge Dynasty on the way home from Lilydale First Baptist. You sing a cocktail of static and bass, sound like you dress to the nines, cowboy hat, fur coat, and alligator boots, sound like you lotion every tooth. You a walking <laughs> discography. Southside Brio, keeper of crackle and dust in the grooves, 
You fell in love with a handmade box of wires at 16 and been behind the booth ever since. From WBEZ to V103, you'd be the coolest gent, king of the dusties. Your voice wafts down from the ceiling at the hair lab. You supply the beat for Kim to tap her comb to. Her brown fingers paint my scalp with white grease to the tunes of Al and Barry and Luther. Your voice, an inside out yawn. The sizzle of hot iron on fresh perm. The song inside the blackest seashell washed up on a sidewalk in Bronzeville. You soundtrack the church picnic, trunk party, Cynthia's 50th birthday bash, the car ride to school, choir, checkers, your voice stretch across our eardrums like daddy asleep on the couch. Sound like grandma's sweet potato pie. Sound like the cigarette she hide in her purse for rough days. You showed us what our mama's mamas must have moved to. When the West Side rioted the day MLK died, you were audio salve to the burning city, people, your voice a soft sermon soothing the masses, speaking coolly to flames, spinning black records across the airwaves, spreading the gospel of soul in a time of fire. Joycetta says she bruised her thumb, snapping to Marvin's got to give it up, and I believe her. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm a little beside myself because this is so special. Um, I'm going to stand both because it helps me read. Um, and my mom is here, so she's probably not happy that my belly is out. <laughs> also because if I stand, I could be almost as tall as Diamond for this <laughs> um, Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this moment with you. Uh, I'm going to read a couple things that are in keeping with the really an extraordinary work of these folks that I'm so grateful to call my friends. Um, this poem is called At the Salon, so we can be <laughs> three for three. Um, <laughs> this is the British edition of Electric Arches, and I think it's a little wet, because it's like a rectangle instead of a square, so. <laughs> um, at the Salon. Sorry, baby, says Miss Annetta as she pulls my head by my hair through plastic and sees my jaw flex and muscles in my neck that had been invisible. Soon I am in a house. No, I am in an ocean. No, I am plasma in the sun. No, I am an atom in a particle accelerator and time is so slow for me. I don't know it. And before me, the whole universe is here like the closing scenes of Kubrick, vast and flowing. And did you know glass is a liquid? It's moving before your eyes but too slow to see. That's what this is. I am in the universe and it is my hair. Each strand arched, electric, and perfectly still before my eyes, dancing, crooked, arranged, just so in the air like the last humming chord of a song. I watch them from inside. One is white, twisting amidst the others like a bolt of quiet lightning. She tugs some more and now I am a veiled woman. I see the world from here, and the world is dark brown, and the world keeps me modest, hidden from without. I am not a face, but a lace curtain, as over a woman betrothed, as over the window of a solemn neighbor, as over a passing hearse. I sit a little taller, for one so hidden must be of consequence. She combs again, and I see again the dryers, the flickering television, the open sign through which men sometimes peer, eyes finding gaps in the neon as they pass in the street. Thank you. Um, I was trying to read like only super sad poems. But this is a sad poem. Um, is anyone here from Logan Square? Okay, one person, two people. Is it, did anyone ever go to Logan Square before like 2000? The year 2000? Okay, right. Okay. Uh, this is a this is an elegy for the discount mega mall. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, sad. Also, if you are if you're not from there, or if you never went to the discount mega mall, feel free to insert the lost discount mall of your childhood, of your youth, uh, wherever you're from. For you, I trace. The letters of my name in the air with my pinky, like a gold necklace, like a signature on a grain of rice in a little jar. 
eve, the night before, like a dusk, like the end of things, beloved. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read two more poems. Uh, we were, I was like a little nervous. I had, you know, I'll be reading poems no more. Uh, so frequently. Um, but I'm going to read two new poems. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I've never read these poems before, so they might be garbage shots, but. Um, Exclusive, yeah. Exclusive drops. Um, but you know, I think part of part of Diamond's generosity is to make spaces where we can share our tender selves. So, um, okay, I'll read the more sad one first. Um, this is called I, "I Want to Write About the Puppy." I want to write about the puppy beneath the hurts, mine and yours, the burned brown the sooty air and the rusty water, the times I was horrible, the times the car broke down, the holes in the wall, the fish whose bodies float to the surface, the frogs God doesn't make anymore, all the things we wasted, the folks who sleep alone tonight curled onto steel. I just don't trust myself that I've got it in me. I don't know if I'm good enough, I know so many words, but I wonder if it's in there. The word I need to tell you about the first time I ever saw a puppy. On Fletcher Street, some child marching triumphant into our circle, holding the wriggling pit bull. We were bidden to come, come see. Her name is Pebbles. And we all grinned, and I wondered at the bare skin at the underside of a baby dog, adorned with freckles. And I want to weep now at the memory of how, when I touched her belly, it was so warm. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read one last poem, and then I have the honor of introducing the woman of the hour. This poem, I don't really, I don't really write love poems, but I wrote one. Um, this poem is called, I Asked My Husband to Wash My Hair. <laughs> oh, it's soft. It's soft. It's soft. call your Uber now. <laughs> I ask my husband to wash my hair, and he does it. Three fingertips to my forehead, turning my gaze skyward, the other hand pushing streams through and through. I teach him to hold the roots so that he can pull at the knots with, if not all his strength, more of it. So tender is he that I worry for my crown, for lingering foam like the crest of a wave and castor oil, and peppermint unrinsed. And I say, more, it's OK. And placing my hand on his, move his fingers to the center of my crooked part to push my thinnest skin. And now, I look for every way to say what I mean about the moving hands. Something like a creature from a dream moving through a forest under a bright, bright moon, or a mist drifting along a perfect highway, or something gleeful in the grass. But in the end, the hands elude metaphor, so perfect are they, so perfect it is. I can only call them what they are, the hands of my love, at my ear, in my hair, at the back of my neck, in water. So careful is he, and so steady, guarding me from what may sting, I don't even close my eyes. Thank you so much.
our dear friend, Diamond Sharp. Uh, please give it up for Diamond. Diamond has written like a, a four-word biography, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, but, but I'm going to tell you some more things. So here's what she wrote. Diamond Sharp is a poet and essayist from Chicago. True. <laughs> Super Sad Black Girl is her debut collection of poems. And bio. Okay. <laughs> However, um, I took it upon myself as a social scientist to do a brief survey prior to uh, coming up here this evening, and um, I asked uh, Jamila and Rach to each think of an adjective to describe diamond, and both of them said, not trying to be clever, simply trying to be accurate, sharp. Um, which, is, which is just true, like we're not trying to be corny, it's just true. Um, we also said exacting, um, Jamila said exacting, I said discerning, discernment. Um, Diamond Sharp has never told a lie in her life. I feel confident, <laughs> ever. She is a committed truth teller. Um, she doesn't have it in her to, to speak falsehood. Um, and because of that, um, many years before our current much overdue, deeply necessary conversation about mental health, and particularly about black women's mental health, Diamond was absolutely the first person I ever knew. Um, to talk publicly about mental health, um, as Jamila said, to, to give language to things that many of us held in secret, held in shame, um, when we sometimes ventured out to try to share, were rebuffed. And uh, I think it is such a tremendous gift that she has shared so much of herself with, with us um, in this book. But I also want y'all know, if you don't know her personally, that she really doesn't do anything without care. Um, and without, without deep thought. And that includes boundaries and borders, right? So um, please don't come up after her and tell her a lot of depressing things without her consent. <laughs> Just because she wrote a sad book, uh, you know, if you do, she will shut you down. You will be sad. So uh, sadder than you already are. Uh, so don't do that. Uh, she, she teaches a lot of us about boundaries, about transparency, about honesty and commitment. Um, and so, I, 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 I try not to be prone to hyperbole, but I do believe that this is a life-saving book, that this will be a life-saving book um, for generations to come who need language that many of us did not have. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming and celebrating our good friend, Diamond Sharp. Um, who wrote Reason. And so 
son, um, she also passed away from pancreatic cancer uh, when she was 34. Um, we have a friend, Fatima Oscar, who often talks about poems being spells. And when I started writing about the rain, she like started popping up in strange places in my life. Um, I was in Woodlawn at Airbnb finishing some writing for another project and it turned out that I was actually around the corner from her childhood home, the home that sparked some of the play, right? Because her father had to go to court because of the racial communists at the time for that home. Um, I was back in New York for an event and it just turned out that the hotel I was at was around the corner from her home in the village. So I went over to like pay my respects. Um, just like in the bookstore, like a used bookstore that like, you could never find anything you want, but like on sitting up top was a book of her plays. And I think most importantly, um, about a year ago, one of her family members reached out um, on Twitter. I think she may be here tonight. Um, but had seen a poem in another book and was like, thank you for writing about Lorraine. And I think it was just a good reminder that these people right, are like visionaries and luminaries, um, but they also have family who are still here with us and who love them and are happy to see their legacies carried on. Mm -hmm. So with that said, exile. Lorraine and I are sitting in her old apartment in the village, two Chicagoans in exile. <laughs> She's smoking a black while I cry a cradle, a glass of penny. Where can we go to be black, Miss Hansberry? The other side, Mars. I've been thinking about leaving. It's the only place for black girls between the perpetrator room and the edge of this universe. Lorraine takes a long drag and ashes her cigar. Exile number two. Me and Lorraine are in the village, sitting in her kitchen. I say, I've been thinking about leaving. I've thought about eating myself whole. Maybe black girls get free on the other side, Miss Hansberry. She likes another black and takes a long drag. She says, black girls don't get free. Me and Lorraine are walking through Washington Park. By the pond, Lorraine takes a drag from a freshly lit black and she says, black girls have always been free. We're from the future. Um, this next batch of poems I wrote in 2015 when I started my MFA program. Um, and Sandra Bland is featured here. Um, that was, I believe, the summer that that happened. And at the time, I believe Sandra was driving, looking at jobs and universities, and my sister, who's they're about the same age, was also kind of driving around rural Illinois, um, interviewing for college jobs. So it kind of like hit me in a very unnerving way. Um, and Rakia, um, Rakia was like one of my cousins, yeah. and my family has been on the West Side since 1937. Um, so just anything happening in that area just kind of hits me close to home. So purgatory room. It's me, Sandra, and Rakia in the back of the purgatory room. I snuck in a bag of Bittner's Crunchy Curls. <laughs> and now our fingertips are covered in a dusty red film. Rakia says she doesn't remember the last time she shot the shit like this. Everything is fuzzy, and her ears still ring from the buckshot. Sandra says this is the first fun she's had in this place. Purgatory room number two. Me, Rakia, and Sandra are in the back of the purgatory room, and this shit is getting boring. Thanks, sir, Moscato. We're Chicago girls, and we'll be damned if we don't save ourselves. <laughs> Sandra says her neck still hurts, and it's hard to swallow. Her hands have been bloody since the day she came. Rakia says she has trouble remembering anything before the bullet. Purgatory room number three. I'm eating shits drizzled in Louisiana hot sauce. The only thing good about this place is the snacks. Rikia <laughs> 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 says shits were the last thing she ate before it all went dark. She and her friends were in the alley shooting the shit, then a shot, then her head started hurting. 
Sandra says she wants to play spades to pass the time, but I don't know how to play. <laughs> she invites guys from the other side of the room. They're from Chicago, too. Um, so, you know, in most books, the narrator isn't necessarily me. But I also don't know how to play spades. <laughs>
making sense of it. So if I get to the end of this poem without crying, I would have really accomplished something. Um, Zoe would be laughing, her very <laughs> great laugh. You know, knew the people here that knew her, she had a great laugh. And she would laugh at me for being so sentimental. <laughs> she would really think that I was a lame. <laughs> <laughs> so, I lost a friend through the door of no return. Today she was alive. It's dark. If I meet you in the middle, we can double back. I can take you with me. Why do you have to go? Time is a circle. I'm here and she's there. We should be able to meet in the middle. Where is the somewhere that she is? Can she catch a ride back? What is the travel time? Do we keep falling and falling and falling? Where is the bottom? Can we leave? Does anyone get to go home? If she's in the past, She's in the future too, and she's here in the present as well. There's never goodbye. Hmm. And I think I'll end with the title of the poem. If I can find it. Oh, well. So, super sad black girl. When I'm tired, I bear my bones, swallow my own hair, recover from my thoughts, drown, tweak, have a fifth of human, eat myself whole, bleed freely, suffocate gleefully, drown, bury this dust, amputate my body, abandon my mind, cry in public, want my ugly, choke, drown, tell the truth, fall, Bleed black, swim in my own blood, stay free, wander, feel entitled, stay black, and die. Please feel free to ask one of our amazing Haymarket team members. 